Um, maybe you can re reply to that in the chat. Okay, so then um, the next speaker is Lyndon Roberts from the ANU, and he will tell us about scalable DFO for nonlinearly squares. Yep, Lyndon. Uh, hi, thanks, Matt. Um, yes, yeah, so this is uh, some joint work with uh, Cora Cartis and a former <coughs> master's student of ours, Tyler Ferguson, who's now doing a PhD at Oxford. So what I want to talk about is, yeah, derivative-free optimization for nonlinear least squares problems, and particularly uh, some of the scalability issues that we see with those. And we're going to look at how we can attempt to address these with uh, techniques from sketching which comes from sort of randomized numerical linear algebra. Okay, so what I'm looking at, and this is somewhat similar to the uh, setup that Fusheng was talking about, is I've got, I'm doing unconstrained nonlinear non-convex uh, optimization. And typically speaking in a local optimization context, we do something like Newton's method, quasi-Newton methods, where essentially we locally approximate F with quadratic models that are in some way sort of Taylor series-esque. Um, but to do that, we need our derivatives. So we could achieve that, you know, if we know the analytic form of F, we could write the code by hand, we could do finite differencing, we could do algorithmic differentiation, or um, which they also call back propagation in machine learning. But that's not always sort of a useful um, set of tools. Uh, if we've got a black box function, so we don't know the analytic form, then we can't write code by hand and often algorithmic differentiation doesn't work. Um, if we've got a noisy or expensive function to evaluate, then maybe the uh, cost or accuracy of doing finite differencing isn't going to work very well. So if you're a noisy function and finite differencing uh, doesn't give you very sensible results at all. Uh, if you've got something that's very expensive, all the perturbations that you need to get gradients out um, might not be uh, feasible for you. So this is where people turn to derivative free optimization. Again, machine learning has different names for everything. They can tend to call them zeroth order optimization, zeroth order methods. Um, and basically, yeah, quite well used in wherever these sorts of three criteria tend to come up. So finance, where you have Monte Carlo simulations, climate, where you have you know, very expensive uh, simulations, and work on applications in image analysis and data science, engineering design, and so on. Um, so it's really targeting these three sorts of settings. So how do we go about doing that? Well, there's several different approaches, but uh, I'm going to talk about model-based DFO, which is really where we try and mimic uh, sort of local gradient-based methods. So if we say take classical Newton method, we approximate our objective locally with a quadratic, that's just the standard Taylor series, but we don't have gradients or Hessians in this world. So let's replace the gradient and Hessian with a vector and a matrix, G and H. And we're going to find uh, G and H without using derivatives. And similar to what Fu Sheng was talking about, we're going to use interpolation. But in this case, we're not doing kind of radial basis functions or anything. We're just doing polynomial interpolation. So we evaluate F at some points near to our iterate. And we interpolate a G and an A, so we interpolate a quadratic. And the essential theory of these techniques basically boils down to if your points are well spaced, so you know, they don't all lie in a subspace or something like that, then you can prove that your interpolation model is accurate um, and that's accurate up to the same, up to a constant as accurate as a Taylor series. And then if your model's basically as good as a Taylor series, then all your convergence results basically flow through from there. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, least squares specifically. So in this case, we've got an objective function that's just the sum of squares um, of this vector function R. And so I'm going to be using this notation a lot. So my objective function has d variables, and there are n terms in the least square sum. So this is going to come up um, a fair bit in the next sort of few minutes. So that's of important notation. So in the classical world where we have derivatives, what we would do is we would take r, which we know that we can evaluate, and we would linear linearize that with its Jacobian. So we'd approximate R with a linear approximation like this. In the derivative-free setting, obviously we can't do that, but we can do exactly the same thing. We can linearize, write down a linearization of R, but replace the Jacobian with some matrix J. And again, we're going to find that using interpolation. 
we're going to maintain a cloud of points and they're going to slowly progress that we're going to move that cloud towards the solution slowly um, so that we interpolate locally and we're going to make sure that that cloud also has good geometry throughout the whole course of our algorithm so we get accurate models but either way once we've done this we either linearize with a jacobian or linearize with interpolation regardless of how we do that uh, we can then take a sum of squares of our model and that gives us a local quadratic approximation to f because we've got a linearized model inside the sum of squares so we get a quadratic approximation and that's not quite equal or not quite approximating the full second order Taylor series, but it tends to be good enough for least squares problems in particular. So that's sort of the general setup when we've got this particular problem structure. And to get something that's globally convergent, um, we'll put this inside a trust region method. And so I'm sure many of you roughly know how this works, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to build our interpolation model. So we get our linear model for R, and then a local quadratic model for F. We're then gonna minimize that inside a Euclidean ball uh, centered around our current iterate. So we pick a region where we expect our model to be accurate and just try and minimize it in that region. And there are specialized algorithms for solving this problem, minimize a quad non-convex quadratic with a Euclidean ball constraint. Then we basically check our progress. We've found a candidate point which is our current iterate plus the step that we found. So we'll evaluate our objective there, check whether or not that point provided improvement. And depending on whether or not uh, we got a good decrease from that, we'll update our current iterate and our radius delta k. The new bit, so, that's, so steps one through three are standard trust region methods. But in the derivative free case, we then have one more step, which is to manipulate our interpolation set. So what we'll typically do is we'll add in our new point x plus s, uh, even if we had a bad step. Um, even if we rejected that point, we will include it because we want to bring in the most recent information that we have available to build our local models. And potentially, we might also move some points around to make sure that we have good geometry of our points. And uh, we'll do things like typically calculation of Lagrange polynomials for our interpolation set um, is a good way of ensuring that. So this basic idea, um, yeah, I've got some software DFOLS on GitHub, which implements this idea. It also uh, have software for general objectives that use quadratic interpolation of your full objective rather than linear interpolation of your residual functions. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Let's now talk about scalability. And this is one area and um, I guess Fusheng probably knows this in the case of global optimization, but even in the local optimization case, uh, DFO methods are known not to work particularly well for large scale problems. In this case, we could talk about either a large number of variables, D large, or in our case, the one I'm gonna talk about today is a large number of residual points, N. And so uh, there are particular cases uh, in data science, uh, data assimilation, these sorts of areas where you do get very large least squares problems coming out. And this is sort of a big outstanding problem that a DFO just can't match the scalability of standard kind of derivative based optimization right now. So what I wanna do first is just to have a look at where this problem comes in. What, what's sort of causing a lot of these issues? And to do that, what I picked is I just grabbed uh, my DFLS software. I uh, ran it on the generalized Rosenbrock function, which if you formulate it as a least squares problem, you've got twice as many uh, terms in your sum as you have variables. And I just ran it uh, for a fixed number of iterations for a varying number of problem dimensions and measured the runtime of the different uh, components of the algorithm. So basically the blue part corresponds to solving my interpolation linear system. So this is just building my interpolation model for R. So finding this JK matrix that I spoke about earlier. <clears throat> the orange part of the runtime is building the quadratic model. So once you've got JK, you need to calculate essentially this linear model squared. So you need to compute your model gradient and your model Hessian. Uh, the Hessian is of the form essentially J transpose J. So that is where the orange component comes in, just literally building the quadratic model by multiplying matrices. And then the green part is everything else. So that's solving the subproblem, that's choosing 
um, points based on new geometry, calculating Lagrange polynomials, all of these sorts of aspects coming in there. And if you add up what these costs end up to be on a per iteration basis, uh, you can see that uh, the interpolation linear system is the most expensive uh, is order d cubed plus m d squared. So it's d cubed because you have to factorize the linear system, which is order d by d. And then you've got to solve it in the least squares case for n right hand sides because you need to interpolate n different residual functions. You then have to form your quadratic model and that's just standard dense linear algebra. And then all your sub problem and geometry and everything, all of that is just done using standard operations in RD. So solving linear systems and this sort of thing. So you get order D cubed work per iteration. So this is the problem that I'm looking at. We get a massive increase in runtime. Uh, and that is coming from the fact that we have a linear algebra that's pretty expensive in terms of um, the dimensionality of the problem. So what I'm interested in here is can we take a DFO method for least squares problems and just make it faster? Can we reduce the runtime? And ideally, we want a situation where we don't lose a lot of performance in terms of actual objective reduction as well, which makes a lot of sense. So the idea I'm going to talk about here is dimensionality reduction in the number of variables n. And what I'm really looking at is sort of what they would talk about as a big data regime uh, in the machine learning case. So if we've got a very, very large number of residuals n, uh, essentially compared to the number of variables we're trying to fit to. Um, I've also got some other work um, where we do dimensionality reduction in the variable space, but today I'm talking about dimensionality reduction in the number of residuals and the observation space. And what I'm going to do is take some ideas from randomized numerical linear algebra sketching techniques. So let's talk about those. Um, I expect they're possibly a little bit less well known um, with uh, sort of an optimization audience. So um, the motivation that I'm coming from is uh, linear least squares problems. So just minimizing AX minus B, uh, where A is a full rank matrix. And this is again, this is a situation where we have uh, many more observations than we have uh, variables to be uh, uh, solved for. So standard techniques, you know, solve the normal equations, QR factorization, all of these essentially uh, yeah, typically you'd have a cost of order n d squared to solve this linear least squares problem. Again, if n and d is large, and this is coming from sort of a data science world, uh, this n d squared is just infeasible. So the idea is that you generate a random matrix S. This is going to be a short and fat matrix. So uh, many more columns than rows. And what you do is you pre-multiply your objective function or inside the norm, you multiply pre-multiply your AX minus B by this S. And when you do that, you get a new least squares problem. This least squares problem still has D variables you're trying to solve for, but it's only got M residuals rather than N. So the idea is that you've massively reduced the number of residuals that you've got to solve for. And so if you solve this problem using standard methods, instead of it being order N D squared, it's going to be order M D squared. And in practice, you can make M much, much smaller than N if N is large. So this is the basic idea. But the question is, well, what, when I say a random matrix S, what do we want uh, out of this matrix? And there's basically two properties that you need. The first thing is what you're, the first thing you're going to do is multiply S against A and B. So you want multiplying those two things to be quick. So in particular, it definitely needs to be faster than order n d squared, because that was the cost of solving your original problem in the first place. So you want fast matrix and vector multiplication. The other thing that you want is if you solve this problem for x prime, you end up with a solution that's close to the solution of the original problem, because you're just replacing a problem with an approximate problem. And uh, what you need, so mathematically for this to be the case, is that S is uh, almost an isometry. It almost preserves inner products in the column space of A and the span of B together. So that's the space that you want to essentially preserve uh, distances, angles, and such for. So to do that, there's a couple of choices that are sort of relatively common in the literature. The simplest one is to take a Gaussian matrix. So every entry is just a normal random variable. Um, the next one is to take a subsampling matrix. 
where essentially you just randomly pick certain returns in your sum. So at least squares you write it as a sum. Um, then you just randomly pick a subset of terms in that sum, and then you rescale appropriately. So each row of S is now a random coordinate vector. The other way is called a hashing matrix. And in this case, instead of essentially putting random unit entries in each row, you now put random unit entries, but actually plus or minus one entries in each column. So that way it guarantees that you pick up every term in your sum in some combination, but you replace, then you take linear combinations essentially of terms and you put them inside your smaller sum. Now of these, the, of the last two are sort of more important. Gaussian is good sort of theoretically, but if we look at the idea of we want to be able to do cheap matrix multiplication, uh, it really helps to have sparse matrices. So subsampling and hashing tend to be more common in practice, uh, even though Gaussian has quite good properties in terms of isometry. So the sorts of theory that you end up with um, looks something like this. So this, ca this case, I'm talking about a hashing matrix. And if you set M, so this is the dimension that you're reducing into, in the order of essentially D squared. Um, and in particular, this dimension is independent of N. It doesn't matter how many residuals you start with. You just take approximately D squared terms in your sum, and then you solve this uh, sketched problem, this smaller sketch problem. Well, it turns out that that takes approximately um, order number of non-zeros in A, um, which essentially measures your matrix multiplication to, pr to produce the sketch problem, plus polynomial in D time to solve the sketch problem. And you can guarantee that the solution you get out is within a factor of one plus epsilon of the, of the optimal solution of your original problem with high probability. Obviously, this is randomized, so there's always a probability of failure. This is the sort of result you get. You can do dimensionality reduction independent of the number of variables you end up with. So this is a very common idea, and uh, it's you know, been used in linear least squares, matrix factorizations, low rank approximation. People are now starting to look at it in optimization, uh, BFGS, Newton's method, nonlinear least squares problem recently. Can we use this in DFO? And what I'm going to do is use sketching to reduce the linear algebra cost by looking at the interpolation linear system. So in the interpolation system, I've got a problem that looks like what I've written here. We've got our differences of interpolation points. We find our Jacobian and we've got a matrix here. We've essentially got N right-hand sides, one for each term in the sum, which gives us essentially the rows of J. Then what I'm gonna do is make it a sketch linear system. So I'm gonna take this sketching matrix S and I'm going to manipulate it so that I'm essentially post multiply uh, by S. And then what it turns out I end up solving for is S times J. So I end up with fewer right-hand sides. I go from N right-hand sides down to M right-hand sides. So I massively reduce the number of right-hand sides and I end up getting a sketched model that corresponds to approximating linearizing S times R. So I get a model that is now in RM rather than in RM. So this is very much inspired by what they do in the linear least squares world. But now all I've done is I've got a smaller linear system that finds S times J as a single matrix. We don't find J and then compute S times J. We actually solve our linear system specifically for SJ. And that is where we benefit from reducing the linear algebra cost there. This gives us a linear model, not for R, but for S times R. So the dimensionality reduced version of it, we can put it in a local quadratic model and carry on as before. So the key thing was, does this reduce the linear algebra? And I'm not gonna talk through all of this, but we have um, the same sets of costs as before, solving our interpolation system, building the quadratic model and sort of everything else. But now for the sketch cases, we have to form our sketching matrix so do our random sampling, and we have to form this sketch linear system as well. And Gaussians are slow because you end up with a dense S. So doing all this matrix multiplication is not very useful, but if you do sampling and hashing where you end up with sparse S's, you get quite a good um, cost in terms of constructing that problem. And now the cost of solving the interpolation linear system, you have N D squared for your N back substitutions. And when you sketch it, you end up with M D squared. And essentially, if you add all this up and you look at the big data regime as n goes to infinity, 
the key benefit you get is that your cost per iteration drops from nd squared to nd. So you lose a factor of d in your linear algebra costs in this big data regime. So that's sort of the key benefit here. Question is, this is obviously an asymptotic result. Does this correspond to a reduction runtime in practice? So what I'm showing here is picking a problem from the cutest collection of nonlinear optimization problems. And this is actually a machine learning problem. This is uh, calibrating a logistic classifier for the MNIST handwritten digit collection. And here we've got an N that's of order 60,000 D about 500. So I've got a very overdetermined least squares problem. And I'm plotting the objective value versus runtime for different versions of the algorithm. And I allowed myself out up to four hours to solve this. And basically, the no sketching, the original version is very slow. It takes a long time to get moving. It does end up with the best objective value in the end, which makes sense. It's solving the most accurate problem. It's building the most accurate models. But the set sketching based methods, and in particular, the hashing methods, um, have this nice combination of being very fast and also producing the best objective decreases as well. Um, and we're talking over an order of magnitude faster in runtime than solving the non-sketched version while achieving a broadly comparable objective value within this four hour time limit. Um, Gaussians are the slowest and that's basically because doing this multiplication, this dense multiplication of applying S uh, slows you down, but actually it still does quite a good job. Sampling is fast, but in general, it's less accurate. Um, in order to get sampling to work well, you, because you're just randomly picking terms in the sum, it, you really need to know which terms to pick and you can't do it genuinely randomly. You usually need a bit more information, uh, which is very hard to achieve. You need to know something essentially about the singular values of your true Jacobian. Um, so it's very hard to get sampling to work effectively, which is why it doesn't reach as good an objective value. But in general, we still get order of magnitude decrease in runtime, which is good. That's the sort of thing we were hoping for. The next one, I'm now looking at just hashing. So the one that sort of worked the best and looking at what difference the sketch dimension makes. So starting at m is equal to d and all the way up to m is equal to 10d as a comparison. And in all cases, we get, again, this massive order of magnitude speed up in runtime, but we get a bit of a spread now in terms of how well we get in terms of the objective value we reach after this sort of budget. And essentially the larger you make M, the slower your runtime, but you get a better objective decrease. So there is a bit of an inherent trade-off here, but that's sort of the basic uh, situation. Uh, even with M is equal to 10D, you've still got a very big speed up and you do get um, a better objective value within this budget requirements. Okay, that was all I wanted to talk about today. So in model-based DFO, um, model construction cost is a massive limitation to the scalability. This interpolation linear system does kill you. And in quadratic models, it's even worse because the size of your interpolation system grows massively when you need to build a D by D Hessian. Um, in the least squares case, we're uh, playing around with trying to reduce that cost by using sketching ideas. And in this big data regime, it reduces our asymptotic dependence on dimension from quadratic down to linear uh, when it is the number of residuals that dominate what's going on. So we do get uh, an asymptotic improvement and a substantial runtime improvement in practice. So this paper's up on the archive. We presented it um, as a workshop paper in ICML earlier in the year. Uh, what we're looking at now is what we can prove in terms of convergence guarantees using these sort of asset, these results, that, like I showed you for the linear least squares case. Can we use those sorts of accuracy requirements to give us um, essentially guarantees on the accuracy of our interpolation model? Uh, based on what I was telling you before, we also want to look at adaptive sketching. So varying the size of your sketch uh, as you go progress along the algorithm, because as we saw, Smaller M is faster, but achieves less good objective decreases. So if we start small and increase M, perhaps um, that gives us a better option. And the last thing we're looking at, as I mentioned, is dimensional reduction, not in the number of observations, but in the number of variables. And if you're coming to OSTMS next week, you can see uh, the first work in that direction. So I'll be talking about that there. Okay, that was everything I wanted to say. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much for your, your talk, Wim. Uh, 
Do we have any questions from from anyone? Uh, yes, I do actually. Um, thanks for the presentation, Lyndon. Uh, just one question regarding. Um, uh, as, an as an alternative to sampling, would it make sense to uh, use a low rank approximation to the Haitian? Um, potentially. So I guess is this in terms of a subsampling matrix you're thinking of? Uh, yes. Yeah, so imposing structure in the Hessian is a good idea. Um, we have looked at low rank. So essentially to get a low rank um, Hessian, essentially, you want something similar in the Jacobian space. And we've looked at low rank Jacobians before. And the problem that we've found with that, and that's related to this um, block method that we're talking about next week, is that it means that when you solve the trust region problem to find a step, you only move inside a subspace. So you're limited in how, in where you can explore. And so you need to couple that with some mechanism that changes essentially the column space uh, of your Jacobian each time, each iteration. Otherwise, you'll never be able to see the solution unless you got really lucky with your subspace choice. I see. Um, so it is something that we're looking at, and um, but it's kind of tricky to get working um, because you need this. You need to be able to change your space, which requires more function evaluations, but we're assuming that those are hard to get. So how do you trade off changing subspaces with um, sort of being kind of conservative in function evaluations. So right. uh, the answer is yes. And people, in the general objective case, people do look at lots of structure in the Hessian. So uh, people looking at things like low rank perturbations of Hessians, uh, imposing sparsity structure, these sorts of things people are looking at for the general objective where you have to literally just interpolate a Hessian um, because there you get, you know, you need to find these squared unknowns. So it's, um, you know, that's a massive linear system if you don't impose some extra structure on it. Right. So there's a whole bunch of techniques around there and we're looking at those in this dimensional, in this subspace uh, exploration case as well. Uh, it's very tricky to get that working. I see, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Any further questions? Hi, yeah, um, a wonderful talk. And uh, I had a, a, a question related to your numerical results. So yeah. as um, because your method sort of is based on random, like uh, randomly you have to put this um, plus one or minus one entries, yes? Yes. So, and this ran random entries may affect, uh, you know, when you run in different, uh, uh, trials, you may have different results. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Normally, when you do this, do you calculate the mean and also standard var this uh, variations, or you don't need that? Um, yeah. So there's so there's actually two sources of randomness with hashing. There's is it plus one or minus one, and there's also where the entries are placed. Mm -hmm. So actually, the indices um, are also randomly generated. So yes. Um, now, it's been a little while since I ran these numerical results. Usually we do run, I think I'm probably showing an average of multiple runs here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I can't remember whether I've looked at the variance of these, um, but mm -hmm. certainly my experience in general is that it's mm -hmm. not so much the decrease over runtime that's going to be the issue. It's going to okay. be sort of where it ends up at the end. You might get yeah, a little okay. bit more variation. Yeah, yeah hopefully it's cool. Mm, it's quite just stable in a sense, yes. I think um, that yeah. that tends to be my experience, but it's been okay. a few months okay. since I've run these results, so I can't remember the specifics. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but we're hopeful in the end we might be able to prove things like very high probability convergence and these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. We're hopeful okay. Um, okay. that that mm. won't be anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think probably let's move on to the next talk now. So thank you very much.